Welcome to everyone joining us for this preview. It'll be for the meeting that takes place at Turfentine on the inside track, Thursday the 2nd of March. Joining me on the line is Alistair Cohen. Welcome, Alistair. How's things your side of the world? Yeah, Sheldon, uh, lovely to be back, lovely to be chatting to you again. Um, yeah, start of March, and uh, it's an exciting time to be in Dubai. This is really what I signed up for. We've got Super Saturday coming up this weekend. Saudi Arabia's big day um, just last weekend has taken a little bit of a sting out of the tail from Super Saturday, if truth is told. It does seem um, a little bit on the shallow side, although the quality is still high compared to previous years. This year's Super Saturday does look a little bit... Um, on the shallow side, but with that said, Dubai World Cup at the end of the month is, is likely to be an all-timer. I've seen a list of horses that are, are sniffing around certain races and it's some of the best around. And then obviously from a South African perspective, the Cape Summer's over, so the road show now moves up to Joburg and the, the World Sports Betting Classic and Wilco Wolf's Drift South African Philly Classic on Saturday. I must confess, I like that card a whole lot more than the card that we're about to talk about. So uh, let's hope that we can build a little bit for that meeting on Saturday, but I really like what I see for Saturday's big card. Well, excellent. Let's get straight on with the show. And race number one, number nine, Sharapova. This is from the Mark de Cox stable. Does look the horse they all have to beat. Just looking at the three runs to date. Second, second, and then third last time behind Senora Victoria. Is this your first selection? Number nine, Sharapova. I believe number one is a late scratching. Just having a look, number one, Mo the Man is scratched. Now, so that makes Sharapova pretty much tough to beat. Yeah, the scratching of Mo the Man does simplify this race a lot more, Sheldon. I think Sharapova is overdue. I know the yard hold her in high regard. She's obviously from the famous Mother Russia, therefore another Russia family. And I remember her first run that she was caught, actually her second run that she was caught to have in Cape Town. She got awfully tangled up in the stalls and subsequently scratched when Bernard Vade Herb was caught to take the ride. But her two runs in Cape Town were pleasing. Um, she's had a nice 40-day gap in between. We saw Black Egret. And there was a, another horse that came up from Cape Town not so long ago out of a work ride. Well, that was actually Black Eagle, um, out of a work riders race. And, and, and the traveling showed no ill effects. Anfield's rocket in the ether to horse from Grant Maroon's yard um, that had come up. And even Ozan Kerr from Tony Peters' yard. That's all I'm thinking about. Um, so there's no ill effects in the travel. And I think everything points to number nine, Sharapova, as being the one to beat. The tongue tie goes on. Um, maybe that will just help her, her see out the race and, and not hold her breath. There are two horses that I think are on the radar to run well. So if you're looking to take swingers, and trifectas with these two horses. Number two, Gimme a Diamond. The last run behind Vitilia shows that he's on the right track. Vitilius came out and ran a fair race and a novice handicap subsequently. And number five, Free Movement. I'll put that disappointing last run down to a poor draw. I think he's better than that. He's well-bred. He's related to um, Folk Dance and Bunker Hunters, number five, Free Movement. I think if we see more of what we saw first time out from the Son of Mars from our fate, he could run a big race. But all in all, I think he's got his work cut out to turn it around with uh, number nine, Sharapova, who also gets a useful sex allowance. Let's move on to race number two, which is going to be a very exciting contest. I say that because Raffles and Aravadicia, they're going to lock horns once again. It's over 1,450 metres Whilst I've gone number one, Aravadicio, from the Mike de Cox stable, I'll be looking for them to have a double on the day. For the pundits out there, the structuring of the race certainly suits number five, Raffles, and he does stand out as the one that sh as the individual has to beat. Yeah, I think that they, those are the two horses that should fight it out. With a bit of respect for number four, Fast Love, because he runs well on the inside track, but I'm not sure he quite has the class of these two three-year-olds who are feature race contested. Um, they've met each other twice before. It's 1-1 when they met in the Grand Beck Stakes at the end of October. Raffles finished quite well in front of Aravadicho, but I do think Aravadicho um, was a little bit wet behind the ears and also was a second run in a five-day gap, so that could explain the flat run from Aravadicho. And then when they met in the Secretariat on the... Sorry, that was a sea cottage on the 24th of December. There was two lanes between them in favour of Aravadicho, but there's a uh, six kilo turnaround in favor of Raffles. So that's why I'm leaning towards number five Raffles. I'm a little bit worried that he's forgotten how to win. He won his debut. He won beats from Slinky Mapimpi. And since then, he's been a bit of a nearly man. I've spoken to Raymond Danielson in the past about the son of Tom Thief, And I know that he and Roy Magna think that Raffles is well above average. And he's showing that, to be fair. He's not done anything to suggest that he's... Um, 
sort of a morning glory or whatever the case may be. So they are the two to fight it out. I think there are a lot of disclaimers about other horses. Too short for Motown Magic. Two sides to a story I don't think is good enough. I'd also say it's too short for Climate Control, uh, this 1450 on the inside track. And uh, Juliet Tango looks like she needs runs. So by default, Barpot's my, my suggested play. I think you could go one or the other. I think they'll run first and second, one and five, with five raffles being my first choice. Moving on to the next race, where there's a number of horses in with chances. Let's start off with number three, Double Joy. Dennis Schwartz at the moment, he's riding the crest of the wave. Where do you put number three, Double Joy, in your selections, Alistair? On the radar, I've got two horses in the bar pot, Sheldon, and Double Joy isn't one of them because I think impersonation is improving, and I think number six, Island Beauty, is knocking a bit harder on the door than number three, Double Joy. Uh, great. Uh, great stuff from Dennis Wells lately. He's come back from Mauritius, and he's a he's a different rider. He's a completely different rider, um, and it's it's great to see. Uh, and the opportunities are now coming his way. And since getting back to South Africa, the second half of the season, he's a man that I think everyone's going to be following with uh, with a whole lot of um, of interest. But I think he'll be hard pressed to deliver number three, Double Joy to victory. I like what I see from impersonation as she continues along. Um, I think the run to three strands, although it was a big field and the form line would look a lot of, a lot better than it ordinarily would if it was a 10 runner field. Uh, the points as horses have been coming out and Keegan DeMello sticks with number two impersonation. So I think that's a good sign. And then number six, Island Beauty, like I said, she's knocking at the door. The last run to Cape Lutz, even though she was well beaten, that's a reasonable piece of form. And then penultimate start, which came over this distance, or, be it, or rather came over 1450 on the classic track, um, being my and it ran a good second the other day behind Just Be Nice. So, so that all sets fair to suggest that number six, Island Beauty, won't be too far away from winning. So two horses for me in the bar pot, two and six in the opening leg of the place accumulator. Moving along to race number four, here they'll jump over 1,600 metres. It's a 90 handicap. And you're going with three runners in the bar pot, numbers three, seven, and nine. Kicking off with Crimson Princess, Julius Mariba rides from the best of the draw. And if you look at the form, never far off the action. Well, you've just summed up the exact picker why I like number three, Crimson Princess, from the best of the draws. I thought her last run, when having a horrible draw over 1,400 metres on the stand side track, was actually a good run. She took her medicine, she dropped out, and she finished off her race nicely behind Sister Light in that race with the likes of Wakanda and Emerald Princess. Emerald Princess was unlucky not to finish closer in a graded race on Sunday. So I think Crimson Princess, to this level, from a, a Phillies and Mayors 96 to a Phillies and Mayors 90, with the, the handicapper helping another pound, I think she could be well set up to run her best race in a while. And as you mentioned, the runs to Emirate Gina, who subsequently won the Phillies Mile, and Gilded Butterfly, who of course won the Yellowwood. That was in the Yellowwood. That was her career best, Crimson Princess. I think that this could be the right time to strike. And I wouldn't read anything into Julius Mariba riding and not Ryan Munger, because uh, Mariba uh, rode her to good effect last time out, and I reckon he would have asked Ashley Fortune very nicely, can I stick with her? The two three-year-olds that I think are very much in the race, number seven, Queen of Smoke, now gets the services of Keegan DeMello. The draw is a little bit of a worry because it's not Pettigrew style to run from double-figure draws on the inside track, but maybe he's setting up Queen of Smoke for something in the future. I don't know, but I think she brings good enough form to be very effective here. I thought her last run to Miss Cool was a, was a good effort on the back of her run to Emerald Princess, and we've spoken about her. And then number nine, Kate Lance, with a very light weight, I think that she has a chance of being well above the handicapper. Probably a late bloomer, probably a late developer. She's had two starts on the inside track behind Intoxicating and Keishio Wazul. So the track's no worry, even though I think she'll be better on a galloping course. I think that she could uh, be on the right mark to go and back up her maiden win. So interesting race. Some real ability here from the three-year-old fillies, Queen of Smoke and Cape Louds, but also... The more solid option, I think, in the older horse, number three, Crimson Princess. I'll be disappointed if anything else in the race does uh, win this because I think that the winner will come from one of those three. Sound advice there from Alistair. So stick with those numbers and hopefully we should sail through. As we move on to race number five, which is a classified stakes over 1,800 metres. Looking at the early selections for Alistair, he's going with one, three, and nine. Let's kick off with number one, Indus Knight. Have you had a chat with Candice lately about Indus Knight? Because if you look at the record, 
two wins and the seven placings. I think that really tells the, the story and sets the profile up for Indus Knight to be a huge contender. He's a model of consistency, and funny enough, since getting to Candice, he's had no luck in running. He needed his first run over 1,500 metres on the inside track, where he ran nasty to cabinet shuffle. His penultimate start, he didn't get away well when the intention was get to the front from draw one, which is obviously where he was most effective when he was winning his races. And after losing ground at the start, he just had to sit midfield and ended up running behind subsequent guineas winner, Eye of the Prophet, who's now rated 112. And then last time out, he, again, he just got buffeted at the start. I hope it's not a habit that he's developed. But now that his, uh, you know, he's come down in class to a classified stakes, and even though the Feliz and Mayors do get a, a useful pull at the weights, being the conditions of a classified stakes, I think that number one in this night could be in the right place. If he goes 1,800 metres and he should have no issue, especially on the inside track, then number one in this night is a live chance. Number three, Little Prince has been on my radar for a very, very long time. 476 days since his last win, which is puzzling because I think he's a lot better than that. When he was with Paul Peter, he was, although outclassed, he was tested at uh, Group 1 level or Group 2 level, even in the uh, Sea Cottage and the Dingons. And, um, you know, since then, his ratings come down. I think they were just battling to find the right distance. Maybe they had a happy medium now, distance-wise, over 1,800 metres. He was tried over a mile and a half, and his last one over 2,000 metres. He finished in front of Celestial City, who uh, came out and won. So that form line is very powerful indeed. And the other backup, even though life is harder for number six, Lady Calavera, she's in such good hearts at the moment. It's hard to ignore anything that Philip Lubbersky and Dennis Schwarz team up with, whether Philip's training and Dennis isn't riding or Dennis is riding and Philip is in training. They teamed up with Midnight Gym on Sunday. Six Lady Calavera with the form that she's in, it's hard to rule her out. So she's got to get into the play as well. Um, interesting race, number nine, Oyster King also gets in. He's fit. His last run was good. He's running his best for a long, long time. I think he goes through stages. Um, so when he's good, he can put up that string of form. But because he races so often, it doesn't take much for him to sort of fall off the limit. Um, but what I saw last time is definitely good enough to respect him. So I think one of those four will win the race. One, three, and nine on my bar pot numbers with healthy respect for number six, Lady Calavera, despite life being a bit harder for him now. Let's move straight on to race number six and get a cracking. This is a novice handicap over 1,450 metres. And Alistair, we know when it comes down to these novice handicaps, you've got to do your studying and just look at the weight structuring. And you're going with numbers one, three, and six. Let's kick off with number one, Golden Prospect. Still lightly raced, had the seven runs to date for a victory and three placings. Last time they tried the blinkers and the tongue tie. Yeah, and it looks like the blinkers and the tongue tie will stay on. I find him very hard to read, Sheldon, because I believe that there's some ability there. And I've spoken to his part owner, Robert Bloomberg, on countless occasions about this horse, and he thinks the horse's rating is too high. Still, he thinks 91 is a trifle too high for the son of Pomodoro. But he's so down in class, and it's also his first run in a handicap. So I think it points to number one golden prospect running his best race in a while. I actually called his debut win on the 23rd of April. It was one of my first meetings back last season. And I was so encouraged and so impressed with the way that he won. And I actually thought Hollywood Betts Gravel was a bit too tight for him and possibly also a bit too soon for him. And he didn't disgrace himself on Hollywood Betts Durban July Day and Marshall World of the Sport Gold Cup Day running very good races to Cousin Casey. But he's just been a bit flat coming back. So whether there's something niggling him, worrying him, or just whether he's just been in a, a class above where he needs to be, I suppose we'll learn a lot more after race number six on Thursday. So I'm not going to let number one golden prospect run loose. I think he's a live chance. Number three, rollover Red Rover really impressed me just uh, eight days before this race. I didn't give him much of a chance in that novice handicap, but he still acquitted himself of nicely, running a length behind Celtic Rumors, and she's going to win her races. Uh, rollover Red Rover backs up just eight days later, so clearly not a scratch on him. I think that I uh, underestimated him, so he's got to uh, get into the play. And then number six, Future Wolf. This is the horse that interests me most. Heather Adamson's kept this horse to running in these novice handicaps quite a lot. Whenever she can find a novice handicap, Future Wolf seems to be in there. He's got 52 and a half kilos on his back. And one of these days he's going to pop up and, uh, and he's going to get the job done. Despite all the hints 
of the wind not being too far away. He's failed to do so, looking dangerous in some of those runs along the way. Um, maybe just the confidence. Uh, actually, funny enough, I think going to the inside track could be the catalyst to number six, Future Wolf. I think on the on the, on the the long striding course of the Vol Classic track and the Tier 14 stand side track, he moves up to a point and, and just fails to find that little bit extra. So so maybe number six, Future Wolf, is looking for the tight inside track. So another horse that's uh, got to be respected. Right, let's move on to race number seven. You can be... Short and sharp here because just looking by your numbers, you don't trust this race at all. Horrible race, Sheldon. I've actually taken a leaf out of the Sheldon Peters playbook, <laughs> and I like a horse at any price here in the form of number 11, Eagle Alley. If you have a look at, he, he, he won his first two starts, and he actually looked really promising. His highest rating achieved is 93, which is obviously um, inflated. Uh, he's nowhere near a 93, but he's now down to a 61. Gets a further two and a half kilos off the back, and there were signs of life last time. I know he was still well beaten by Prairie Falcon, but he still showed that there is a little bit of this there. So number 11, Eagle Alley, is my each way play in a very, very tricky seventh race. Uh, I think that he could make us a little bit of money. Whether he wins or not, I have my reservations. But I think if he's going to run a big race, this could be the time to strike. The other horses that are in, and I had a long time um, sort of putting pieces of the puzzle together, and I'm probably nowhere near, three, seven, and nine go in with 11. So number three, Iron Tail. If the inside track's not too sharp for him, he's you know, running in good enough form. Seven, Robert Burns is probably, well, not probably, he is my top choice in the race, but don't hold me to that. And then number nine, follow my path on the back of a, a contentious win last time over the course, uh, rather over 1450. If the distance is in a little bit on the sharp side, I expect him to be bang there as well. But 11, Eagle Alley, my each way play in a very open seventh race. Well, I like your thought of thinking there at a decent price. Eagle Alley, you spot on for the merit rating guys out there who watch their form studying and see the horses drop down to a rating where they can be competitive. You're 100% right there. Eagle Alley could be the horse to cause a bit of a stir. And I definitely think there'll be race time support for this individual. Cracking on to races eight and nine. Race number eight is over 1,450 metres. Who would be your top two selections? I see there's a number of horses with some decent form and some horses who could certainly come up to the plate. Yeah, I like a bit the number two, Bart of Avon here, Sheldon. You'll remember him from Hollywood Bed Sturban July Day a couple of years ago when no one was there. And Bart of Avon won the sales incentive race and looked like a very smart horse in the process. And he's done sweet little since. But I think a combination of probably having to run in the wrong races and, um, you know, just sort of getting his rating down to a more competitive mark. Number two, Bart of Avon showed a lot of laugh last time. I mean, I really liked him behind Out of the Darkness. I can't remember who I did the show with. I actually think it was, it might have been Raheel on that occasion. And I made Bart of Avon a, a, a solid place bet in that race. And he didn't let the team down. He's obviously got a lot of weight to shoulder this time around. He's got 62 kilos. But, you know, the company he's kept is a lot better than the company he keeps on Thursday afternoon. So he's my top choice here. Um, other horses that have got to get a mention, number one, Cabinet Shuffle, he's got even more weight, which has made a little bit lighter by Siandas Asibos, seven and a half kilo claim. Siandas ridden him once before and won on him. When similar conditions, when carrying a, a huge weight and uh, winning from start to finish on this course over 50 meters further. So number one, Cabinet Shuffle is obviously on the radar. Number five, Melek. I'm not convinced, I must be honest, from beating Meteoric to taking on these hard knockers. I think he's got a hard ask ahead of him on Thursday. Um, I must be honest, I prefer the stable companion, number seven, Kotinos. And then Candace Dawson's runner, number six, Clarks, and you've got to run that, watch that last run over 11.60. Another stride, he wins the race. Um, Keegan DeMello takes over from a good draw. He will be banged there. Um, can't put anyone off if you like, number six, Clarks. But... In my heart of hearts, I think number two, Bart of Avon, just with the horses that he's run with, might just have a slight edge. Just getting back to number six, Clarkson, because I was going to pick your brain about this individual, watching that last race, as you mentioned, another two strides or so, a different story. Any reason for the drop back to the 1160 or just the way of the program? It uh, was just the reset button, to be honest, Sheldon. Um, the, last, the penultimate run, rather, on the 5th of January, he moved up so dangerously on the classic track and then just eased out of it behind, by the way, spoiler alert, 
the horse who I think is the biggest runner in the Classic. I can't tell you how much I like Billy Bowlings to win the Group 1 on Saturday. Um, so in hindsight, it probably wasn't a bad run, but a trifle disappointing. And a combination of Candace, Keegan DeMello and the owner saying, let's go over shorter. And the only race that presented itself um, with a reasonable draw, he was nominated in a few races, but pulled horrible draws. So it ended up being on Guinea's day on the outside um, over 1160, which everyone knew would be too he, he ran so nasty. So that was a combination of, of jockey, trainer, and owner, you know, putting their brains together, finding the right race, getting reset, and and going from there. So he'll be a he'll be a big chance on Thursday. I think he'll run in the first three. But like I said, I think Bart of Avon might just have the edge. Moving into the final hurdle, where number seven, Atisha's Angel, will be a popular selection for a number of the punters out there, has the draw. And if you look at this daughter of Patala Palace, she's been runner-up in two out of her last three runs, with a fourth in between behind Cool Winter. Where would number seven, Atisha's Angel, be in your pecking order, Alistair? She's right up there, Sheldon. The uh, scratching number four, South Boy, um, alleviates the headache, but still leaves a, a little bit of dust upstairs trying to work this race out. I think you're probably going to be defaulted towards number seven, Letitia's Angel. Ryan Munger takes the ride for Ashley Fortune. Uh, this, again, a, a merit rate of 72, so she takes on Boyd, but that's no issue for her because, and as you talk, those um, three of those last five runs where she's run nasty have, have come against Boyd. So... I don't think she's too worried about those. I think the inside track probably suits her as well uh, because she's got a short but very sharp burst, um, number seven, Letitia's Angel. So, yeah, she's got to go in. I actually think the stable companion, number 11, Timbavati River, could be a big danger out of barrier one. Again, Julius Marie Barad for Ashley Fortune. So he's very much on the radar. And if you're looking for a horse that's totally um, off radar, I think number 13, Rio's Kiss, could be a horse just to watch and keep uh, on your side. I know that she's a one-time winner, but the start of her career was a lot better than what she's showing now. Her ratings come down again. There hasn't been much signs that a win just around the corner for number 13, Rio's Kids. But Telefasanda Bowley is riding very nasty at the moment. Grant Maroon's horses are, are hitting the crossbar just without getting there. I think that she could be the one to make traffics and then Quartet's pay. It's a it's a very tricky and number one Stormy C has finally got into the number one box last time out. He's got a heavy weight to shoulder again. Um, he's got to be respected. I think that I think Ashley Fortune, funny enough, I think she wins the race with preference for seven Letitia's of Angel over number eleven Timbavati River and a nice Quartet play with number thirteen Rios because there are a few horses on this card that are big prices that I think can make things pay. Super. Well, you heard from Alistair there. Just before we say goodbye to him, we will bring up our suggested bets for the day. But he does mention number 13, Rio's Kiss is a nice roughie. So what he's trying to say is throw in as many runners as your budget will allow. And if number 13, Rio's Kiss, number 13, lucky for some, unlucky for others, does come through, then the sky is the limit as far as the payouts go. Let's go on to the suggested bets. Alistair Cohen and myself, we've given our suggestions. Suggested bets. We'll bring up Alistair's bar pot in a moment. Banker five in the opening leg. By numbers two and six, followed by three, seven, and nine. In the fourth leg, numbers one, three, and nine. Next leg, one, three, and six. And the last leg, that'll tell the tale. No fewer than four runners. Three, seven, nine, and eleven. Now, when it comes to the suggested bets for the day, I was in a corner, so I decided instead of going for a bar pot or a place accumulator, let's try the decock double, although the second leg does look a lot tough, tougher. Race one, number nine, Sharapova, the win bet. So the first one is Sharapova, number nine, to win on to race two, number one, Aradovicio. But as you heard from Alistair, Raffles is really well-weighted in that contest and will be a big adversary for him. Thanks very much, Alistair, for joining us on the line and hopefully all things going according to plan. We should be in the winner's queue. Sheldon, thank you so much, and chat soon. Always a pleasure. Thanks very much to Alistair Cohen joining us on the line for the Turfentine Inside Meeting. And as we say, we've done our bit, and let the horses do it for you on the track.